It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Rachel Conn. She is an academic, author and broadcaster. Canadian-born, Rachel taught religious studies at universities in Canada, the UK and Australia before joining the ABC in 1992. She is perhaps best known as the producer and presenter of The Spirit of Things on Radio National. She has won three international radio awards and produced documentaries for ABC TV's Compass. She's also gained a Doctor of Letters from the University of New South Wales in 2005 for services to the community, fostering religious understanding through broadcasting, public speaking and writing. Will you now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Rachel Conn and our speakers, Professor Krauss and Dr. Craig. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Hello, I'm very pleased to be the host of this night's exciting event, the discussion on life, the universe, and nothing. The questions of belief and unbelief and where and who we are in the universe and how we got here continues to animate human thought today as it has in the past since the written word gave us the Upanishads, the Sutras and the books of the Bible to name just three religious bodies of thought. But then there were the philosophers of ancient Greece and Rome and later of the medieval world where Muslims, Christians, and Jews exchanged philosophical and theological ideas, sometimes under duress and other times voluntarily. Today, I think we might be engaging in these debates with a mixture of reasons, but whatever they are, rational thought and the imagination continue to chart new vistas of knowledge and plumb new depths of human and spiritual understanding. Tonight we have two world-renowned thinkers in two very different fields and yet they overlap. As they face each other, much as our politicians recently did, my guess is that these two will be more daring, more forthright, and definitely more illuminating than we have so far witnessed in our political leaders. So let me introduce to you each of them. Lawrence Krauss is an American theoretical physicist and cosmologist who is foundation professor of the School of Earth and Space Exploration and director of Arizona State University's Origins Project. He is the author of several best-selling books, including The Physics of Star Trek and A Universe from Nothing. He's an advocate of public understanding, of science, public policy based on sound empirical data, scientific skepticism, and science education. And he works to reduce the impact of superstition and religious dogma in popular culture. William Lane Craig is a research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He spent 15 years in Europe obtaining two doctorates, one in philosophy, one in theology. He spent seven years at the Higher Institute of Philosophy at the Catholic University of Louvain, Belgium. His research interests include the interface of philosophy of religion and the philosophy of space and time and the philosophy of mathematics. He's authored or edited over 30 books, including the Kalam, Cosmological Argument, Theism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology, Time and the Metaphysics of Relativity, and Einstein, Relativity, and Absolute Simultaneity. His aim, contrary to Lawrence Krauss, is to argue that science does not nullify faith, 
nor the existence of God. So may I, without further ado, invite each of you in turn to give your 15-minute presentations uh, successively. First, I call on Lawrence Krauss. Thank you very much. That was very, that was very brief. Thank you. Thank you. I had a poem up so you could read something while I was being introduced. Um, before I begin my 15 minutes, I want to just, um, first of all, thank all of you for coming. It's kind of amazing to see all of you here in this beautiful auditorium. But I also want to thank the City Bible Forum. Um, everyone has been remarkably gracious to me, personally. And uh, I've come to respect everyone I've gotten to know uh, in the Forum. And, 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 and that's Peter and Robin and Emma and Danielle. And particularly, uh, and uh, right now, Ian, who provided me with some whiskey um, <laughs> in honor of my friend, late friend Christopher Hitchens. But um, I think that's one real distinction between an Australian Catholic, Christian group and an American one is that I would never get whiskey in an American uh, one. Um, so applause to, for, to, I really would like to thank all of you, and I think they all deserve an incredible round of applause for putting this on. Okay, so now I'm going to begin, just so you know. My, I'll check my time. Okay. Um, one of my, that was a long poem that I happen to like because it's depressing, but this is a less depressing one, um, one of my favorite quotes, which is the, the initial mystery that attends any journey is how did the traveler reach his starting point in the first place? Now, in some sense, that's the subject of, this, of tonight's discussion, but it's, it's, you know, we're going to discuss in some sense how the universe began, but... It's also more important because we're, we're at a new starting place. That's what I want to point out. What I want to talk to you about is how we got to the starting place we are now, which actually depends upon learning and knowledge and empirical evidence. We're at a very different starting point now than we were in an Iron Age when peasants wrote down some book before they even knew the, the Earth orbited the Sun. And so I want to try and take you to the present time. And... Um, but before I do that, I want to, in the interest, because I'll be talking about full disclosure, I want to uh, disclose a few things. I, I want to talk about science primarily, and that's the reason I, come, I, I do these kind of things, because I think science has an incredible ethos that's important. It involves open questioning, no authorities. There are no scientific authorities. Honesty, transparency, reliance on evidence, understanding uncertainty, which I'm sure is a topic that's going to come up tonight. Peer review and testability. And I also believe that those things actually make the world a better place by overcoming myth, superstition, dogma, and fanatical certainty, some of which we'll hear later. Um, I, I also have a respect for rational discussion. I hope we'll have one. But I also, and I've come to know Dr. Craig a little bit. He's a fine gentleman. Uh, 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 and nevertheless, and it's very difficult because I, he seems to be a very pleasant and gentle man. I have no respect for dishonest distortion and misrepresentation, and I do feel, unfortunately, that Dr. Craig does that considerably. In Brisbane, I discussed it at greater length, and it's that, that's coming out on video, so I don't want to waste that, your time. You can watch that video. I think I hope to de demonstrate some of that tonight when it comes to the science. And also, clearly, this is an amazingly complex topic, and neither Dr. Craig nor I are going to have time to do it justice. Uh, uh, but I hope at the very least to raise questions and to raise discussion. And I hope that's what we'll both do. And motivate, in particular, skeptical thinking, not just about him, of course, but about what I say. And, uh, uh, and rational and open inquiry. Okay, good. Now, the, now, once we get to the discussion, it's going to turn into gobbledygook. Um, so I thought I'd at least, so it wouldn't be a total lost cause, I'm going to give you a 10-minute science lecture. Cause, so that way, at least if the rest of it turns into... Physical, philosophical mumbo-jumbo, at least there'll be some content. Um, so the, the question is, why is there something rather than nothing? And there are lots of different ways to answer it. You could write a book about it, which doesn't say anything about anything, doesn't explain anything, or you can do, you can do something else. You can ask the universe. And that's the point. The, whole, the main point of what I often try and convey is the sense that we force, should force our beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality. And if we understand that about the universe, we should look at the universe and try and learn from the universe, and whether we like it or not, accept those results. Not something we like, 
but the way it actually is. Okay, so the main thing, the first thing that I want to get straight is in fact, modern cosmology essentially began observationally 80 some odd years ago, when, uh, or nine years now ago almost, when Edwin Hubble, 80 years ago I guess, um, discovered that the universe is expanding. So Edwin Hubble was looking at, these are not sperm, these are galaxies. Um, but, and what Edwin, Edwin Hubble discovered when he looked out remarkably was that if you look out at distant galaxies, they're all moving away from us, and those that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast, those that are three times as far away are moving three times as fast, and so on. Now, when you look at this, it drives you to the Christian worldview that we're the center of the universe. But of course, that's wrong, like everything else about the Christian worldview. It, we get that impression because of our myopic place. We are stuck in our universe. Most of us are, as I often say, the, the Republican Party in my country isn't, but the rest of the, uh, uh, many of the other people, most of us are stuck in our universe. So to see that this really implies that the universe is expanding, we have to get outside of our universe, which is something we may, you know, which may actually be possible in the real world, but in fact, now it's very simple. I can create, sorry, I can create a universe, a two-dimensional universe, that I can watch very easily, and from the outside, I'll see I put galaxies here at regular intervals, and you can see at time t1 that that region of the universe is smaller than it is at times t2. It's expanding. You can see it from the outside. But what would you see if you lived in that universe? Well, pick a galaxy, any galaxy, say that one. To see what you'd look like from that galaxy, I just want to superimpose this image on top of this one, putting that galaxy on top of itself. What do you see? You see exactly what Hubble saw. Every galaxy is moving away from you, and those that are twice as far away from you are moving to, have moved twice the distance at the same time. Those that are three times as far away have moved three times the distance, and so on. And the point is, it doesn't matter what galaxy you pick. It happens for any galaxy. So it depends on your theology, I suppose. Either there is no center of the universe, or every place is the center of the universe. It doesn't matter. That's semantics. The point is, there's no special place. Every place is the same, and we are just in some random place, and what Hubble discovered is that the universe is expanding. Well, that changed everything, as I'm sure Dr. Craig will point out, too. It meant, of course, if you work backwards, it appeared the universe had a beginning. But it also implies something else. It also implies the universe may have an end. Because if it's expanding, the question is, what will happen in the future? Many of us are worried about the future and not the past. And the, it turned out Einstein told us an amazing thing. Matter and energy curve space. And because of that, the universe can exist in one of three different geometries, so-called open, closed, or flat. And, you know, I can't draw three-dimensional curved universes. I can draw two-dimensional curved universes, so these are analogies. But in a, in a three-dimensional closed universe, if you look far enough in that direction, you'd see the back of your head. Okay? I can't, I can't draw the picture for you. But so, this is a closed two-dimensional universe, an open one and a flat one. And the big question of 20th century and 21st century cosmology came, which universe do we live in? Because if, as you add matter, you go from an open universe, if you add energy, you go from an open universe to a flat universe to a closed universe. And interestingly, if you live in a universe full of matter, a closed universe will expand and then contract in a big crunch, the reverse of the Big Bang was an open universe will go on expanding forever. So if you want to find out if the future is fire or ice, you have to weigh the universe. And that's what we spent about 100 years doing. And the key quantity that we need to measure is this quantity. Physicists, whenever we have an important quantity, we give it a Greek letter to sound scholarly. And we call this omega. Omega is the ratio of the actual density of the universe divided by the density of an exactly flat universe. So if omega is bigger than one, the universe is closed. If it's less than one, the universe is open. And we've been trying to measure omega for 90 years, and we now know the answer. I don't have time to tell you. I'm happy to talk about it in the question period if you want. We have discovered remarkably that omega, as far as we can tell, is precisely equal to one. We live in a flat universe, and that's not flat like a pancake. That's a flat universe. It's just one where the three axes, the x, y, and z axis, and you notice I said z because I'm in Australia, um, point in the same direction absolutely everywhere. Just the universe you always thought you lived in. So omega is equal to one. That's an amazing discovery. Now I want to take you back to one of your favorite times in school, high school physics. And I want to ask the question, how will the universe end? We're going to focus on the beginning, but it turns out beginnings and endings are irrevocably tied together, not just in literature, but in reality. So to answer the question, how will the universe end, I can ask the question, what happens if I throw a coin up in the air? 
as you may have learned in high school, probably in Australia in, in primary school, if I throw a coin up in the air, it comes back down. If I throw it up harder, it comes back down. If I throw it up really hard, hard and there's no ceiling, it doesn't come back down at all. And physicists, we teach high school students how to do the calculation. When will a coin escape? Well, we write down the total energy of the coin. I'm sure this brings back fond memories. There's a pot, it doesn't matter what it is, there's a positive piece we call the kinetic energy and a negative piece we call the, the potential energy. And the amazing thing is we turn it into bookkeeping. We turn the whole thing into bookkeeping. Because it turns out, if the total energy is positive, the coin will escape. If the total energy is negative, so this term beats that term, the coin will come back down. Well, we can do the same thing for the whole universe. If we look at uh, Mr. Hubble and we're standing here, we can ask, what's going to happen to the universe? Well, if the universe is the same everywhere, then whatever happens to every galaxy will happen to any galaxy. So we just have to look at a given galaxy and ask, will it escape? Will it keep going forever? And the positive piece, the velocity of that galaxy, depends on something Mr. Hubble measured called the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe. The negative piece comes from the mass density of the universe. And we just compare those two. If B, if the negative piece is bigger than the positive piece, or B over A is bigger than 1, the universe will collapse if it's matter dominated. If B over A is less than 1, it will expand forever. But what, we've dis what is really amazing is that B over A is nothing other than this quantity omega, which we've measured to be precisely 1. And that means B is precisely equal to A. And what does that mean? That means the negative piece is precisely equal to the positive piece. And what does that mean? That means the total energy of the universe is precisely 0. Now, if you were going to create a universe from nothing, what would you make the total energy? That's the first hint that perhaps you could create a universe with 100 billion galaxies, each of which contains 100 billion stars, from absolutely nothing without any supernatural shenanigans. Now, nothing is an interesting concept, and in order to try and shorten things, I actually discovered this week a video of me in 2 minutes and 30 seconds talking about it. I figured I couldn't do it that fast on stage, so here you go. When you think about nothing, you have to be a little more careful than you normally are because, in fact, nothing is a physical concept because it's the absence of something, and something is a physical concept. And what we've learned over the last hundred years is that nothing is much more complicated than we would have imagined otherwise. For example, the simplest kind of nothing is the kind of nothing of the Bible, say the, an infinite empty space, an infinite dark void of the Bible. You know, nothing in it, no particles, no radiation, nothing. Well. That kind of nothing turns out to be full of stuff in a way, or at least much more complicated than you might have imagined, because due to the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity, we now know that empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence at every moment. And in fact, for that kind of nothing, if you wait long enough, you're guaranteed by the laws of quantum mechanics to produce something. So the difference between empty space with stuff in it and empty space with nothing in it is not that great anymore. In fact, they're different versions of the same thing. So the transition from nothing to something is not so surprising. Now you might say, well, that's not good enough because you have space. Where did the space come from? Well, this, a more demanding definition of nothing is no space. But in fact, once you apply the laws of quantum mechanics to gravity itself, then space itself becomes a quantum mechanical variable and fluctuates in and out of existence. And you can literally, by the laws of quantum mechanics, create universes, create spaces and times where there was no space and time before. So now you've got no particles, no radiation, no space, no time. That sounds like nothing. But then you might say, well, you know what? You've got the laws of physics. You've got the laws of nature. The laws themselves are somehow something, although I would argue, in fact, that that is not at all obvious or clear or necessary, but even there, it turns out physics potentially has an answer. Because we now have good reason to believe that even the laws of physics themselves are kind of arbitrary. There may be an infinite number of universes, and in each universe uh, that's being created, the laws of physics are different. It's completely random. And the laws themselves come into existence when the universe comes into existence. So there's no pre-existing fundamental law. Anything that can happen does happen. And that, therefore, you got no laws, no space, no time, no particles, no radiation. That's a pretty good definition of nothing. So science has demonstrated, in fact, that it's not only plausible but likely that you could create a universe from nothing by the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity and a measurement which could have been falsified. Every property of the universe that we measure is consistent with the universe which came from nothing by the laws of physics. Does that prove it was the case? Absolutely not, but it makes it plausible, which is a key point, without miracles. The other key thing is that nothing, in my case, we'll talk a lot about nothing, I'm sure, in fact, 
it probably will. But the nothing is the absence of everything that characterizes our universe. You can make lots more fancy definitions of nothing. But the real miracle that the Bible was trying to explain is how you get all the stuff. You can get all the stuff without having any stuff. And that's the key point that I care about without any miracles. Now, I want to spend the last two minutes just mentioning some things that I think Dr. Craig will talk about, having listened to him. Now, in fact, this you can't see very well. This is something he showed, and he may show again. He showed in Brisbane. It's something he likes to do, sort of like a syllogism. Some logical argument which makes it appear necessary to have God. And he said, well, every existing thing that has an explanation has an explanation of its existence. Okay? And then he said, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. And the universe is existing, and therefore the uh, explanation is of the existence of the universe must be God. Boy, that's ironclad. Is it? Well, you know, the key point is here. You've got to accept when you have these syllogisms, you have to accept that this is true. And this is just a random statement that if the universe has an explanation, the explanation is God. Well, great. But that sort of assumes the answer before he asks the question. Syllogisms are very dangerous. Here's an example. All mam if you make the wrong logical statement at the beginning, you can get wrong results. All mammals exhibit homosexual behavior. True. William Lane Craig is a mammal. True. Therefore, William Lane Craig exhibits homosexual behavior. Now, that isn't true. Well, as far as I know. But the point is, you can get that if you, if you just blindly accept the assumptions at the beginning. And those assumptions are the ones I don't want you to blindly accept. Now, we'll, I'll probably zip through this because I think William is going to talk about the Kalam, maybe, and, and Islamic wisdom. Get it? Islamic wisdom. I had this exact same debate with an Islamic fundamentalist who used exactly the same arguments to prove the Quran was absolutely true that, that uh, William will do in th this case. But again, the arguments are not, uh, the statements are none of which are true. And I, I, I won't go through them because we'll have a chance to talk about them. But none of those statements are true in, in modern physics. And therefore, the argument is irrelevant. Now, the, it is true that the Bible said the universe had a beginning well before science did. Great. But so did everything else. So did the Norse creation myths and the Rig Veda. And the Bible got it wrong. They do the creation in the wrong order. So, in fact, as, as St. Augustine would remind, uh, I'm sure, Dr. Craig, the Bible isn't a scientific document. And therefore, to argue that it got it right, well, you know, every creation myth indicated there was a creation. It's a natural thing. And I won't even go into La Maitre. I'm going to try and end in one minute, with, the, with the, another statement that Dr. Craig has made. Because for Dr. Craig, the beginning of the universe is very important. Because if it had a beginning, he believes it must have come from God. And he quotes a theorem due, due to a, a few friends of mine uh, that basically says the universe, if it's expanding now and, a, as we measure it, had to have a beginning. And he argues that that's, that's irreconcilable to, with anything else. And I, as we argued in, in Brisbane, I said, that's not true. And he said, no, Alex Vilenkin, one of the authors, has recently shown it's true. So I wrote Alex, who's a good friend of mine, and he just emailed me. And he said, only theorem is only as good as its assumption. There's a loophole for contraction, private expansion, and there's no such thing as absolute certainty in science. Note, for example, the BGV theorem uses the classical picture of space-time. In the case of quantum mechanics, it's out the window. And at the beginning of the universe, that's when quantum mechanics matters. So, the last thing that is often used is the question of fine-tuning. The universe appears to be fine-tuned for life. Well, that's an old argument. You should have heard it before. Life appeared to be fine-tuned for life. Every form of life appeared to be fine-tuned for the environment in which it lived, and that's why God existed. But we now know that's not the case, because Garman told us, you know what? Natural selection produces that kind of possibility in the form of life. Well, if there are many different universes, we would be amazed to find ourselves living in a universe in which we couldn't live. That would be worth having a discussion on stage about. Okay? So the fact that if there are many different universes, the fact that we happen to be fine-tuned to the universe that we live in is not too surprising. But in fact, it's worse. Because just like evolution, the fine-tuning is miserable. I get backaches because I'm not designed to sit at a computer. And in fact, the fine-tuning could be much better than it is. Life could be much more prevalent in the universe. So this fine-tuning argument is garbage. And I think I will conclude with that and just say what we mean by some, something and nothing has completely changed and that's the important point and that change is not a bad thing it's called learning and the important question I would argue is not the question we're talking about why is there something rather than nothing but rather how did the universe evolve and how, what, what's going to happen and how can we find out and the way we can find out is by asking the universe questions and not making it up thank you
Well, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. And I also want to begin by thanking the City Bible Forum for putting on this extraordinary series of three dialogues between Dr. Krauss and myself. And I want to thank Lawrence Krauss for his participation in these dialogues. The great German philosopher and scientist Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz famously wrote, the first question which should rightly be asked is, why is there something rather than nothing? Before we can even begin to address Leibniz's question, it's important that we clarify the concepts involved. The word nothing is a term of universal negation. It means not anything. So, for example, if I say I had nothing for lunch today, what I mean is that I didn't have anything for lunch today. If you read in an account of World War II that nothing stopped the German advance from sweeping across Belgium, what it means is that the German advance was not stopped by anything. If a theologian tells you that God has created the universe out of nothing, he means that God's creation of the universe was not out of anything. The word nothing, to repeat, is simply a term of universal negation, meaning not anything. There's a whole series of similar words in English that involve universal negation. Nobody means not anybody. None means not one. Nowhere means not anywhere. No place means not in any place. Now, because the word nothing is grammatically a pronoun, we can use it as the subject or direct object of a sentence. By taking these words, not as terms of universal negation, but as words referring to something, you can generate all sorts of funny situations. If you say, I saw nobody in the hall, the wiseacre says, yeah, he's been hanging around there a lot lately. If you say, I had nothing for lunch today, he says, really? How did it taste? These sorts of puns are as old as literature itself. Do you remember the scene in Homer's Odyssey where Odysseus introduces himself to the Cyclops as no man or nobody. One night, Odysseus puts out the Cyclops' eye. His fellow Cyclopses hear him screaming and yell to him, what's the matter with you making so much noise so that we can't sleep? The Cyclops answers, nobody is killing me. Nobody is killing me. They reply, if nobody is attacking you, then you must be sick, and there's nothing we can do about it. In Euripides' version of the story, he composes a sort of Abbott and Costello who's on first routine. Why are you crying out, Cyclops? Nobody has undone me. Then there is no one hurting you after all. Nobody is blinding me. Then you're not blind. As blind as you. How could nobody have made you blind? You're mocking me, but where is this nobody? Nowhere, Cyclops. The use of these words like nothing, nobody, no one, as terms referring to something is a joke. How astonishing then to find that some contemporary popularizers of science, whose mother tongue is English, have used these terms precisely as substantive terms of reference. They've told us with a straight face, for example, that there are a variety of forms of nothing, and they all have physical definitions. The laws of quantum mechanics tell us that nothing is unstable. 70% of the dominant stuff in the universe is nothing. There's nothing there, but it has energy. Nothing weighs something, and nothing is almost everything. All of these claims take the word nothing to be a substantive term referring to something. For example, the quantum vacuum or quantum mechanical systems. These are physical realities, and therefore clearly something. To call these realities nothing is at 
best misleading, bound to mislead and confuse lay people, and at worst, a deliberate misrepresentation of science. Such statements do not even begin to address, much less answer, Leibniz's question as to why there is something rather than nothing. In his review of Dr. Krauss's book, A Universe from Nothing, David Albert, an eminent philosopher of quantum physics, explains with respect to Dr. Krauss's first kind of nothing, vacuum states are particular arrangements of elementary physical stuff. The fact that some arrangements of fields happen to correspond to the existence of particles and some don't is not a whit more mysterious than the fact that some of the possible arrangements of my fingers correspond to a fist, and some don't. And the fact that particles can pop in and out of existence over time as those fields rearrange themselves is not a whit more mysterious than the fact that fists can pop in and out of existence over time as my fingers rearrange themselves. And none of these poppings amount to anything even remotely in the neighborhood of a creation from nothing. He concludes, Krauss is dead wrong, and his religious and philosophical critics are absolutely right. Now, I think that Dr. Krauss really knows he's not talking about nothing. He just pretends to be talking about nothing. In a dialogue at the Australian National University, he candidly admitted that the question, why is there something rather than nothing, sounds like a religious question. But, and I quote, I use it to sneak in modern cosmology, which is what he really wants to talk about. This is most unfortunate. Modern cosmology is fascinating enough in its own right that we don't need to try to sneak it in by having it masquerade as an answer to a philosophical question, like Leibniz's. The cosmological theories to which Dr. Krauss refers have exactly zero relevance to Leibniz's question. As Christopher Isham, Britain's leading quantum cosmologist, has written, the one question that even a very ambitious creation theorist cannot or perhaps should not address is, why is there anything at all? I propose that henceforth we simply avoid the troublesome word nothing and focus on this question. Why does anything at all exist? Leibniz came to the conclusion that the answer is to be found in God, who exists necessarily and is the explanation why anything else exists. We can put Leibniz's thinking into the form of a simple argument. So, premise one, every existing thing has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. Two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Three, the universe exists. Now, what follows logically from these premises? From premises one and three, it follows four, Therefore, the universe has an explanation of its existence. And from 2 and 4, the conclusion logically follows. Therefore, the explanation of the universe uh, is God. Now, this is a logically airtight argument. It is not guilty of the equivocal fallacy that Dr. Krauss's mammalian argument is guilty of. That is to say, if these three premises are true, then the conclusion is unavoidable. So, if the atheist wants to reject the conclusion, he has to say that one of the three premises is false. But which one will he reject? Premise three is undeniable for any sincere seeker after truth. Obviously, the universe exists. So the atheist is going to have to deny either premise one or two if he wants to be an atheist and remain rational. So the whole question comes down to this. Are premises one and two more plausibly true or false? 
Well, let's look at them. According to premise one, there are two kinds of things, things which exist necessarily and things which exist contingently. Let me explain. Things which exist necessarily exist by a necessity of their own nature. It's impossible for them not to exist. Examples? Many mathematicians think that numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects exist in this way. By contrast, things that are contingent do not exist necessarily. They exist because something else has caused them. Examples? Familiar physical objects like people, planets, and galaxies belong in this category. So what shall we say about premise one? Well, if you reflect on it, premise one seems very plausibly true. Imagine that you were hiking through the outback and came across a translucent ball lying on the ground. You would naturally wonder how it came to be there. If one of your mites said to you, it just exists inexplicably, forget about it. You'd either think that he was crazy or else he just wanted you to keep moving. No one would take seriously the suggestion that the ball just exists there with literally no explanation. Now, suppose you increase the size of the ball in this story so that it's the size of a car. That wouldn't do anything to remove or provide for an explanation of its existence. Suppose it were the size of a house. Same problem. Suppose it were the size of a planet. Same problem. Suppose it were the size of the entire universe. Same problem. Merely increasing the size of the object does nothing to provide or remove the need for an explanation of its existence. Something has to explain why it exists. So it seems to me that premise one is more plausibly true than false. So what about premise two? If the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Is it more plausibly true than false? Now, at first blush, this premise might strike us as controversial. But in fact, atheists typically agree with premise two. For what does the atheist typically say in response to Leibniz's argument? The atheist typically asserts the following. A, if atheism is true, the universe has no explanation of its existence. But this is logically equivalent to B, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, then atheism is not true. And notice that B is virtually synonymous with premise two. So when the atheist says that given atheism, the universe has no explanation, he is implicitly admitting premise two, that if the universe does have an explanation, then God exists. Besides that, premise two is very plausible in its own right. For think of what the universe is. All of physical reality, including all matter and energy, it follows that if the universe has a cause of its existence, that cause must be a non-physical, immaterial being beyond space and time. Now, only two sorts of things can fit that description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or else an unembodied mind or person. But abstract objects can't cause anything. That's part of what it means to be abstract. The number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything. So it follows that the cause of the universe must be a transcendent mind. And this is what the theist typically means by God. Thus, premise two also seems to be plausibly true. Given the truth of the two uh, premises, or three premises, the conclusion logically follows. God is the explanation of the existence of the universe. Moreover, the argument implies that God is an uncaused, unembodied mind who transcends the physical universe and even space and time themselves and who exists necessarily. We're not talking about some ill-conceived flying spaghetti monster, but a being with specifiable attributes. This conclusion is staggering. I hope you begin to grasp the power of Leibniz's argument. If successful, it proves the existence of a necessary, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, 
personal creator of the universe. And he is the answer to the question of why anything at all exists. Thank you. Whew. I don't know if you feel as overwhelmed as I do, but um, where to begin? It seems that we must begin with terms. How can we have a dialogue about nothing if we simply do not agree on what it is? Lawrence, well, well, I, and I, may I call you by your first names yes. as we are in Australia, that's yes. the convention here, yeah. even though we are no, no, all from North America. Yeah, yeah, no, no. And I, and <laughs> Originally. I, I appreciate you calling me Lawrence, because we're both from Canada, so you don't call me Yes, Lawrence. that's right, um, he's a fellow Torontonian. Uh, well, I agree, and, and, um, and I tried, uh, with that little video, I tried to be <laughs> quite clear about what I mean. But in some sense, I don't think there's a big difference. Nothing, in this case, is non-existent. The question is, did the universe go from not existing to existing? If it be, it, it, it's quite plausible that it did. It's not required, by the way. It could have been eternal. Certainly could be eternal, given the laws of physics. But, as I said to... And, and William just told me I could call him Bill, so I'm going to do that with no, without any disrespect, okay? Right. Um, that, uh, as Bill said in, 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 in Brisbane... Um, as I told him, I bet that the universe did have a beginning. I don't, that doesn't bother me. In fact, I, I think it's more likely than not, though not required. But that means it did not exist. Now, did anything else exist? Maybe. But our universe didn't. Everything we see, everything we touch, the space that we live in, and the laws that, we, that, that govern us didn't exist, and then did. Now, the problem with definitions, though, is that it's, when you have modern physics... Uh, certain ideas that for which there's words, classical jargon, don't mean the same thing. For example, if time begins, if time begins at the Big Bang, how do you discuss cause and effect? Those, so, so words begin to fail you, as T.S. Eliot would have said. And, and so, but I think the idea is, I, I, I'm arguing that exactly the same thing as Bill is in some sense, non-existence. Lawrence, if, if, if all the materials or elements are present for life to exist, that is, that you detect in the universe, that, of course, doesn't make them cohere into life. So how would you explain how such elements become uh, life in the same way that words in a dictionary do not become an essay or a that's, poem? That's the beauty of That's what I do. Um, that's why I do science, because it's so remarkable. It's so much more remarkable than saying, let there be light. <laughs> it's so much more remarkable to see how you can begin with a universe with no matter radiation, create matter radiation, understand the growth of fluctuations, understand how stars form, understand how planets form, understand how organic materials form in, in bulk, in supernova explosions from stars, understand the amazing processes that happen in the Earth, and understand, of course, the most remarkable aspect that complex organic materials seem to become able to be self-ordered and from a very simple self-reproducing uh, object that appears to take energy from its environment using natural selection you could ev create everything this illusion of design is probably the biggest obstacle the, when you see something it looks like it's designed and I often and I have pictures of you know what look like beautiful Christmas ornaments but of course they're snowflakes Geodesic domes look like they're designed, but carbon-60 soot has the most beautiful geodesic dome. So you have to be very careful when you look at something and say, aha, it's designed, because most often it's just an accident. Well, Bill, should God be subject to scientific or philosophical arguments when to do so would make God vulnerable to the disproofs oh, of new science? Of course now, God isn't subject to, to scientific investigation because science is the study of the physical, natural realm. And so science doesn't have at its disposal the methods to do um, this kind of metaphysical work. That's why 
the name of that discipline is meta physics. Physics. It's beyond yet, physics. But now I, I'd like to respond to what Dr. Krauss just said a moment ago about the beginning of the universe. You can call me Lawrence. Lawrence. All right. Okay. Um, Leibniz's argument doesn't presuppose that the universe had a beginning. It's very important to understand that Leibniz's argument applies equally if the universe is eternal, uh, beginningless, and endless. In fact, Leibniz actually uses the example of a series of geometry books which have been copied from one another from eternity, and he says that still wouldn't explain why geometry books exist at all and why they're being copied. So we can still ask, why is there an eternal universe rather than nothing? But secondly, Lawrence, I've heard you in your YouTube videos and elsewhere make a number of times this claim that anything that begins to exist comes, goes from non-existence to an existence, and in that sense, comes from nothing. And I think that's a misconception. Um, take yourself. You didn't exist prior to your conception. But that doesn't mean that in beginning to exist, you came from nothing. Absolutely. There was a sperm and an egg that brought you into existence that was a cause. So for something to come from nothing would mean that it comes into being without any sort of cause. That's the way we're, okay, we're well, using I the think, term. I, I think there's a really important point there, and it's one of the reasons why that Kalam argument is so nonsensical. Because it says everything that begins to exist has a cause. Okay. Well, that statement, you have to parcel more carefully. But classically, nothing begins to exist. Classically, everything, you know, radiation, matter, does not spontaneously come into existence classically. So from that argument, that claim is completely unobserved because as you point out, everything that you see coming to exist, including me, came from raw materials yes. that pre-existed. But so nothing you, begins to exist. Surely you believe that you began to exist. Well, the, but the point is classic. You just said, I exist from pre-existing materials. Yes, and that's there what were happens. Causes but of in your quantum existence. mechanics, th often things can come into existence spontaneously. Well, that, and that's, that's a for different example, question. Let's, let's, here's a good example. You seem to have problems with the creation of a universe. So let's talk about the light that's bombarding Well, now, wait a minute. I, we're, you're, you're changing the subject well, here. Well, I think I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a point. Let me, if well, you don't think, but you're changing... Let me, let me finish my sentence. If you think it's irrelevant, we'll, then just say it's right. irrelevant, okay? Yes. Good. And we know what your answer is going to be. But, uh, so take a, take a photon. Take the light that's bombarding us so I can't see the audience. Okay. What was the cause of the photon... That, that is hitting your eye. What's the cause? There's no physical cause. It, it was emitted spontaneously. You can't say that there was, that you cannot say that that photon, which was emitted by an electron, which changed energy levels in an atom, had a cause. It just randomly did it. In fact, there's some probability it might take 10 to the 10th to the 10th years to do it. It happened to happen now, and we can argue about probabilities, but in quantum mechanics, the idea of, ca of, of cause in that sense is very different. That's okay that it's different, but it means these classical arguments of Leibniz okay. who didn't know about quantum now mechanics wait. are irrelevant. That, that was irrelevant, that comment <laughs> that you just made. Um, you were saying, before you went on this digression, that anything that begins to exist comes into being from nothing. And I was suggesting that that's misconceived because things that begin to exist, like yourself, uh, have causes so they don't come from nothing beginning to exist, x begins to exist, if x exists at t, some time t, and there is no time t prime earlier than t at which x exists. And things like yourself. So what's the cause of the photon? Bill, can, I, right, okay. can you finish your thought and I'd like to ask you a question. All right, actually, I don't want to rehash the Brisbane debate. We, we had no. an opportunity yes. there okay. to talk about the Kalam argument fine-tuning. Tonight is a different subject, which is Leibniz's argument. And on Leibniz's argument, there is no presupposition that the universe began to exist, nor is there um, a sort of um, claim that the universe is not eternal. So this is a quite different but, question. But there is that May second I ask a question that, here. If it is clear to you that the universe has a cause, why should that cause necessarily be God? And is it because you already yes. believe in God's existence or because you define God to be anything that is outside the observable universe? That was premise two in, in the argument, as I stated. And remember, I gave two defenses for thinking that if the universe has an explanation, that explanation is God. 
The first one is that it's logically equivalent to what atheists typically say in response to Leibniz. Atheists typically say that the universe just exists and that's all. It's a brute fact. No, I, look, I mean, it's ridiculous. Look, I'm, I, you might call me an atheist. I don't label myself, but I'd certainly never say that. You're confusing explanation and purpose. Those oh, no, are two no, very different things. We, one of the reasons I'm a scientist, one of the reasons I do what I do is I want to find out the explanations. I want to ask questions and find out what is, is there an explanation of how our universe came into right. existence. And, that's, and, I, and, I, and I'm agnostic about the answer. Yeah, I think you concede from what I can understand, premise one. But it's not about purpose, Lawrence. We're, we're talking here about explanations. And these could be causal. Um, uh, the, so why God? To do with why God? I well, mean, that's, that's the premise most ridiculous two. thing I've ever That heard. was premise two, and again, the, as I said, premise two is logically equivalent to what most atheists say in response to Leibniz. But then the second argument for premise two was that the only two candidates that I can possibly think of which, uh, for uh, being an immaterial, spaceless, timeless, transcendent thing would be either an abstract object or an unembodied but mind why or does consciousness it have to be, I mean, and abstract that, but objects. All that does is show the limitation of your thinking. I well, mean, and you, that's, what, that's, what's, that's what's... But that's what's great about science. It forces you to change your thinking. There's lots I'm of ready things... To change. Sorry, listen. I mean, the point is, why does it have to be immaterial? Why does... I mean... Oh, that's easy know, to answer. And so to say, the only thing I can think of the point is, are you, one very clear example is in the case of a multiverse, our universe could exist, yes. it, it could come into existence in the concept of, in the context of something that's far greater, far bigger, sure. in which universes may be being created now, and it's physical. There's no, there's no, there's no transcendent right. mind. It, it's like saying right. that life exists and therefore there has to be a creator. Well, there doesn't. No, no, it's much more uh, subtle than that. When, the way I defined universe in my opening remarks was as all of physical reality. And that would include not only our universe, but any wider encompassing multiverse. What, what do you mean by, well, hold on, but now you're being vague, and now you're being, look, we have to be more careful. What do you mean by all of physical reality? Do you mean all of space and time? Um, Is that all, uh, any, do you mean all of space and time? I want to know what you mean, because yeah, as a physicist, yeah. it makes a difference. Yeah, well, uh, I mean any sort of space-time Reality or or something uh, all that's of matter space and, and energy. time in which events happen. Hmm? How, maybe a good way to say it would be all of space and time in which events can happen. But there could be a yeah. lot more than that. My point is that's not everything. All of space and time in which events can happen is just our universe. No, no, it's not because you can have an encompassing space time. No, no, because it may have a very different time. It may not involve events. It certainly does involve anything that happens in our universe. So if no. you say physical reality. Do you mean space and time? If you mean space Not and time, then we live in a four-dimensional spatial universe, but there could be other universes in which even the concept of classical space doesn't exist. Not classical space, but look, Leibniz's question can easily be reposed. Why does the multiverse exist rather than nothing? It's, and then you're, you're on to you the could, You could do that, but multiverse can be eternal. So it doesn't yeah, have yeah, the, the, Leibniz's argument doesn't. But it's a great question, but it's not the question we're asking, which is yes. why don't our universe exist? And that no, has no. a simple answer. No, well, his... can, can I ask okay. a question? Because uh, it's becoming pretty difficult to get in between well, here. Well, actually, I, you and can ask uh, questions, but I think we want to hear between of the course. two of us. Okay. Um, now, today, many of you would have read an interesting news item in the press that John Billingham had died. He was the man who had established the SETI project, uh, scouring the skies, the universes, uh, for extraterrestrial life. Now, Lawrence, you have said that you are painfully aware that humans need to know they are unique, their, their Earth is unique, their universe is unique. But what evidence is there that we are not? And does the failure of the SETI project to find any sign of extraterrestrial life even remotely akin to ours, a further confirmation that we are unique? Well, it's a good question. My the simple answer is one of Carl Sagan gave. Ab absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And the point is that, that we live in a really big universe. And in fact, there's nothing unique about our location in the universe. There's nothing unique, in fact, about the, the, the conditions that led to life on Earth. 
Organic materials exist in profusion in space. Not only have we discovered the basis of amino acids in comets, but we've discovered complex, uh, in fact, complex peptides. And, and, and so organic materials exist everywhere. Water exists everywhere. Sunlight exists everywhere. As far as we can tell, those are the conditions that produce life on Earth. Now, we but are none looking... none of them no, have hold on, hold on. In into but it, life. But, what was that, what was it, but none of them have cohered into anything that resembles well, human life. Well, we know one, one thing we do know is in our solar system, on the surface of planets there right now and, 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 and moons, the conditions don't exist for life like us to exist. So we're looking. But the point is, it's a very difficult task. It's a big universe. One thing we have discovered, which increases our, uh, our, our uh, optimism that there may be life elsewhere, is the fact that as many of us astrophysicists said, all stars have solar systems around them. If you make a star on a computer, you tend to get an accretion disk and you make a solar system. We discovered that not only do solar systems exist, planets exist that we never thought were possible. Rocky planets on the outside of solar systems, gas giants on the inside. The universe always surprises us every time we open a new window. So there's probably a hundred billion solar systems um, in, in our galaxy alone. But let me give you a brief example of why it's so difficult. How would I know life existed on Earth? Okay, intelligent life. Let's say I lived on some other star. Now our sun is only four and a half billion years old. The galaxy is 12, 13 billion years old. So most stars are older. I could have looked at our sun for the last five billion years if I was in advanced civilization. Only during the last 50 years could I have gotten evidence that life existed by listening to I Love Lucy or Q&A or whatever the heck it is. And, and, but then I'd have to know the right channel to listen to. So even if I knew exactly where to look, and what channel to listen to, I have a 1 in 50 million chance of finding the right time on Earth to find intelligent life. It's a hard process, but hard things are what science is all about. So we, undaunted, we look. We don't know the answer, but many of us would suspect there's life elsewhere, and, we're, and in fact, maybe even life elsewhere, microbial life in, on Mars or in the oceans of Europa. And, we'll just, and the point is, we don't know, and that's why we keep looking. Bill, um now, this, this sort of uh, vision is, is rather infinite, is it not? I mean, are, you, you have said, um, well, Lawrence, you, you've said that um, physicists are uncomfortable with infinity. But, Bill, you seem to be more comfortable with it. Is, is that right? Or uh, I, I'm trying to figure out how an infinite universe, which you have said is meaningless, no, oh. you, you, you have said an infinite universe is meaningless. So I, have I, I, I got that wrong? So, no. no, no, okay. Uh, but in any case, this, ha, ha, this question. How does. May I just you ask said you. said infinity isn't physical. So how does your interest in immortality connect or relate to a notion of an infinite universe? Well, uh, I, do we really want to talk about this? I mean, it's off topic. Oh. We're, we're supposed to be talking about why is there something rather something than nothing. Rather than nothing. Well, I, think, but, I, I think it's not off topic because the universe could be infinite in temporal extent. Yes, or and Leibniz's argument is so independent. So if, if we want to talk about how our universe came into being, we no, might no, want to know don't. whether it's infinite or not. No, no, example. as I said, Lawrence, Leibniz's argument is very clearly independent of the question of whether the universe had a beginning or an end. You can ask, why does an eternal universe exist? Now, to answer the question, yeah. I would distinguish between, well, not just I, but mathematicians, between an actual infinite and a potential infinite. Um, an actual infinite is a collection which has a definite and discrete uh, number of um, finite members, which is equal in number to the natural numbers. No, no, that's one kind of infinity. That's, there are non yes, that's all of zero. Infinities. That's the, the lowest. That's a lo they're non-countable infinities. Of course, like they're, the they're non-denumerable okay. infinites. I'm okay. talking about a, a, the lowest de a denumerable infinite. Uh, a potential infinite, by contrast, is uh, a limit concept. Something can approach infinity as a limit, but never get there. For example, you can keep dividing this finite distance in half uh, further and further and further, and infinity can serve as a limit to that process. And I would say with respect to immortality that um, we will live forever in the sense of a potential infinite. The number of years uh, of our existence will always be finite, 
that growing toward infinity is a how, limit. You always say without. these things, but how the hell do you know it? Well, I mean, what, what, this that's is a, a, different it's a statement debate, that Warren. has no basis in empirical well, fact. It's what you'd like to be. No, I and mean, that I find come offensive. On. You, you've not, obviously not read my Well, books. how do you know what immortality is? Well, well, I may seem like this talk is taking forever, but other than that... I, now, look, you are really trying to chase red herrings here to get away from the topic. Well, you just said it, Bill. You just said, I know that immortality is not infinite. Well, that's great. No, I'm glad you know it. She asked me what was my concern. Well, you said it. Okay. Okay, let me ask you something, Lawrence. This is another ridiculous question. Given that everything that science discovers is perceived and mapped out by the human brain, what do you think is greater, the brain, the human brain, or the universe that, recognize, or the universe that it recognizes? Well, first of all, with all due respect, I don't understand what you mean by greater. Is that a value judgment? Significant, yes. What, I mean, what is more ne necessary? Well, I, it, appears to, it, it certainly appears to me that the universe's existence is necessary for my existence. That seems to be the case, although, who knows? I mean, it could be that, that, you, that, I, that I could spontaneously pop into existence without a universe, and maybe I have. But, uh, um, but, but, uh, so, but greater is the kind of thing that, you know, it's just it's, it's an irrelevant question. The point is, the human brain is remarkably complex, and we don't understand it. The universe is remarkably beautiful, and we don't fully understand it, which is, what, which is the joy. The joy of not understanding is what makes life worth living, not the joy of certainty that immortality is potentially finite, or the certainty that there'll be 72 virgins in heaven if you blow up the World Trade Center. Or something. I mean, that kind of nonsense is, is what stifles, it seems to me, that what makes being human worth being human is... It's the uncertainty, it's the mystery, it's not knowing, and that effort to understand this incredibly complex thing, which we, I admit, we may never understand. I mean, some people think that, you know, and physicists are the most obnoxious of all scientists. That's true. No, but, well, just, I, just I'd you. say that. But just me. <laughs> well, okay. Do you? And I may be the most... No, I can say from, from experience that I'm not the most obnoxious physicist. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, although I'm up there. But... Um, but uh, now you confuse me, but the, the point is that, that we, don't, we don't claim to know everything. That's, that's the whole point. We don't claim certainty, and that's great. Well, do you claim certainty? No, no. I, this is, I, I don't get that. No, are you certain that God exists? No. Good. I mean, this is so crazy, Lawrence. You do this all the time in contrasting science and religion with these false dichotomies. Well, when you demonstrate them. I think not. I mean, I, I would say that science and theology are very similar and that they're both on a quest for understanding. Christian faith well, is not a brain-dead faith. Uh, a f it is a rational, inquiring faith. St. Anselm had a slogan, fides quarens intellectum, which means faith seeking understanding. And so, like science, which we as Christians celebrate, Theology has also embarked on Give the me process. Running, I'm going to ask you a question I've asked other theologians. Yeah. I don't think I've ever asked you this question. Maybe I have. No, I bet but you've asked others. You know the question. You're prepared yes. for the answer. Good. Um, good, because I'd like to learn about right. this. Because I've, I've asked a lot of theologians, what contributions to human knowledge has theology provided in the last, say, 300 years? Give me one example. The answer I always get is, what do you mean by knowledge? Now, if I asked a biologist or a chemist or a historian, I'd get a different answer. Yeah. Okay. Theology is the queen of the sciences. The proper object of theology is God. Theology is the study of God. It gives but us. But didn't you say God isn't subject to science? So in what, didn't you did say God? Didn't you say science can't? God is not subject to science. Didn't you say God is, is outside yes, science? So yes. in that case, if theology is study of God, how can it be a science? Well, let him answer the question, no. well, please, yes. because I we're not. We're not, we're not actually going to get anywhere if you're constantly no. talking over Bill. Please. Okay. My, actually, actually, I actually do think we'll get somewhere. We'll get rational and, definitions. Okay. 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 Uh, Bill, All right. if you, you can I will, respond. I'll try to be succinct. And, and then we will go to the questions My from the floor. theology students from Germany often wrestled with the question, is theology a Wissenschaft? That is to say, that's the word for science in German. 
But what they meant by science was in the classical sense, scientia, knowledge. And certainly theology is a source of knowledge. It gives us knowledge of God, his existence and nature, what he requires of us, what our moral obligations are to him, how to find eternal life and forgiveness of sins. These, you may not be interested in, in this, but that doesn't do anything to deny the fact that, that theology is a scientia. It is a body of truth. It is a body of knowledge, just as much as science is scientia about the natural and world. Might, but, but, and, and I might also say that um, in, in the way that Bill is defining knowledge in this way, you also have redefined something like nothing in your right. way. Well, let, so, me, let, me, let me say that there's a difference. And, and, and that the fact is that if theology is, gives us knowledge of God, how come different theologies give you different knowledge? I mean, science, physics that's done in, in the Islamic world is the same as physics that's done in this world. They, they, you know, balls fall, you, Newton's laws work. But in fact, theologians of different religions come up with completely sure. inconsistent views of what God yeah. is and what eternity is. But, but and so if it really is knowledge, it's very particular to where you grew, grew up. Well, but you celebrate uncertainty, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, well, so what's, what's the, why, just as quantum physicists have at least 10 different physical interpretations of the equations of quantum mechanics. They're not, the difference is, if two scientific ideas are inconsistent, one is right and one is wrong, or they're both wrong. Yeah. They're not both right. Oh, oh, but Lawrence, I'm not a relativist. I'm not a pluralist. I, I think that the same holds for theology. And you in think fact, I am, Christianity I am is right and Islam is wrong. I am gratified to hear you affirming the law of contradiction uh, here and affirming okay. the laws of logic. So I Islam do, is wrong. I do believe that Islam is not fully true, that there are elements of Islam that are false. For example, its view of Jesus of Nazareth, I think, is, is patently wrong. Uh, according and, to, and Zeus is wrong? Yes, but let so me... So you're an atheist about all those other religions? Well, no. Okay. Could I just finish okay. my, my statement about where I disagree with Islam? Because this is important, I think. There's probably many Muslims here tonight. Um, according to the Quran, Jesus was never crucified. And that is a view which is rejected by every historian of Hold Jesus. Hold on, every and, theologian. I'm not sure every historian. No, but, the, no, every, will, there is no, no, no that's not true. The, I, I still, the, the we've had this fact, discussion. The one indisputable fact about Jesus of Nazareth was that he was crucified. He died by crucifixion. So if here, he existed. So here we have in the Quran a, a, a book written 600 years after the event by a man who had no firsthand uh, sources with regard to this event, and, and he denies the crucifixion of Jesus. And I think as, that as it's a, for that reason. As opposed to the Bible, Bible which was written maybe 50 or 100 years after the fact. Thank you, okay. Lawrence and Bill. At this point, we really must go to questions from the audience. Otherwise, none of you will get a chance. And um, since I've had to uh, trash most of my questions at this <laughs> point, um, because this has really been a very dynamic uh, argument, but I think that's, uh, that's but, okay that we are. Yeah, I think that's yes. okay. Um, can I just remind you once again to send your short questions to Twitter? It's up there on the screen. Uh, hash L U N Q A and the SMS to the uh, number there on the screen. Uh, I already have some here which have already been uh, sent up. So. The first one is, Dr. Craig, why is God exempt from your definition of something? That is, why can God exist alongside nothing? Right. Can we bring up slide 39, please? Um, <laughs> there. Notice premise right. one says, every existing thing has an explanation of its existence. I don't exempt God. Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason which comes to expression in premise one, does not exempt God. Rather, it would say that God is a metaphysically necessary being which exists by a necessity of its own nature, similar to the way mathematical objects exist if you're a Platonist. So I'm not uh, exempting God from this principle. Good. 
Okay. <laughs> nice and straight. Um, Lawrence, by appealing to an infinite number of universes, aren't you just requiring the existence of an infinite just as theists do? Well, first of all, I'm not appealing to an infinite number of universes, and the answer is I don't know. There may be an infinite number of universes, and I have, you know, if that's the case, I'll live with it. Uh, the, the space itself may be infinite in spatial extent, and as I say, the universe may, although I would doubt it, well, in the future, all the evidence is the future of our universe will be infinite in temporal extent. So I don't have, so infinities are, may or may not exist. The question is to find out why. And so I don't appeal to anything. There may be an infinite number of universes, there may be 10 to the 500 universes, as some versions of string theory suggests, although, again, the calculation is very tenuous. 10 to the 500 is enough to, to, give, you an, to give you what we will call the landscape of, the, of, of natural selection of, 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 of life, if you, believe, if you accept the anthropic argument, which may or may not be true. So you don't need an infinite number of things to, just like you don't need an infinite um, distribution of a population to talk about the natural selection in life. You just need a very, lo you need very long time and a very large number of, of, of members of a species in order to get genetic diversity, in order to get evolution. And so you don't have to appeal to infinity, but the answer is I don't know. Dr. Craig, to prove that Leibniz's argument um, prove that Leibniz's argument is false if God in premise two was changed to Elmo. I, I, the problem is I don't know who Elmo is. Now, if Elmo is, if, well, it did, you mean the Sesame yeah. Street kid? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, Elmo is himself a contingent being, if that's who you mean. I was thinking perhaps they're just calling God Elmo, which is just God by another name. But if you mean the, the sock puppet, Obviously, that isn't the reason why everything exists rather than nothing. That, that's a silly question. Okay. Lawrence, can you please clarify how it is possible to exit the universe? To exit the universe? <laughs> well, what... <laughs> I can think of a lot of answers, but, um... Look, um... To, in a, from a physical perspective, we are tied to our universe. It could be that there are four, that there are, there, it could be, and one of the conventional ideas in modern physics is that perhaps one of the four forces of nature, gravity, actually does exit our universe, namely our four-dimensional space-time. It may leak into extra dimensions. That's an argument, which, I, by the way, I think is probably wrong, but it's certainly got a lot of uh, uh, interest among physicists right now. So there may be forces that actually do exit our universe. Are, are, is in those theories, the particles that make us up, quarks and leptons, are confined to the four-dimensional membrane that makes us up. Now, um, but things can cease to exist in the sense that, I, that both me and Bill will cease to exist when we die in the sense of, a, of our consciousness. Just as my Mac, which is certainly more conscious than the PC that's running that thing, is, um, it will cease to exist when I, when, you know, if I break it. But that's no problem. I don't have any problem with that. Dr. Craig... If someone were, if a Christian were to exit the universe, where would he go, or she go? If, if a Christian were to exit the, the universe? universe? Well, since I believe in the reality of the soul distinct from the body, I think that it, it, it would be possible for the soul to exit the universe. That is to say, it would no longer exist in uh, this four-dimensional space-time. And in that case, it wouldn't be anywhere at all. To ask where is it is to assume that it's still in space. It would simply exist, but it wouldn't exist in space. It, it wouldn't be part of this four-dimensional space-time. Can I ask a question? I mean, I yes. Have a discussion. I waited for you to finish. I tried to do that. You but, did? Yeah, okay. Um, sometimes you make me so mad I can't wait. But anyway, um, you what's the evidence for the existence of a soul separate from the body? What's your evidence for that? Why do you, yeah. why do you have that belief? Is what okay. I don't know. And I mean that honestly. Why do right, you have that right. belief? I'm not trying to... I, I would th say that there are a number of features that are best explained by some kind of dualism, interactionism. One of the most persuasive to me, and I'll be, try to be very succinct, is intentionality. 
the idea of aboutness or of something. For example, I can think of my wife or about my summer vacation. No physical object has this kind of intentionality. The, the desk or the boards or the chair or a glob of tissue like the brain isn't about something. Only mental states or states of consciousness have intentionality. And this seems to me to be an undeniable feature of human experience and phenomena, that we have these states of intentionality. And I think it, they're best explained by saying that there is a mind, a mental a substance. I mean, there we yeah, agree. I, think I agree. Yeah. There's a, the only evidence I can see of intentionality right now is conscious minds. But yeah. all you've done is demonstrate the existence of consciousness, not a soul. Well, you know, you have to have something that exhibits this property of intentionality. It can't be the brain. Well, but then what is consciousness? Consciousness would be a thinking thing, a thinking substance or mental substance. It's, it's absolutely yes, but that's not a soul. Well, I would, I would call a mind the, 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 a What soul. about when, okay, well the interesting thing, when, when, when in a hundred years when computers are self-aware, will they have souls? No, I don't think that, a, that's a good example. I don't think that a computer will ever have intentionality. But again, well... It, because but, a physical object isn't about something else. Are so, we physical objects? And, excuse and me? Are we not, I mean, the, it's a key point. What seems to me what you've done, and fairly clearly, is demonstrate that consciousness is a real example, is, is one of the only examples, and I agree with you, of intentionality. But all you've demonstrated is that a complex physical system can be conscious and be self-aware and have intentionality. But, yeah. I, but not, there's nothing non-physical about it. You've not demonstrated that any of that is non-physical. I mean, you may believe it, and I accept that no, belief, no, no. but there's no evidence for it. Well, I, again, I don't see how views... I think what you're espousing is sort of a non-reductive non physicalism, where you have these mysterious mental properties of the brain, but the brain doesn't seem to have these sorts of mental properties. And this view is also well, incompatible. You're right now. You are demonstrating. Yeah. I mean, well, sometimes. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that the, the soul or the mind uses the brain as an instrument of thought. This is what Sir John Eccles, the Nobel Prize winning neurologist, put Which it Which shows in his, that a Nobel Prize doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, uh, okay, we, there are no authorities. That's the great thing. So I can say nonsense, as you've just argued. John, Sir John Eccles can. The key point is, I, I accept that you think that there's this thing that guides humans, and that's fine that you accept that, but, but accept that there's no empirical evidence for it. You agree? Empirical evidence, well, I think there's the evidence of introspection. I sense my intentional states. There couldn't be, could there be, there couldn't be empirical have you ever evidence. Fooled your, have you ever fooled yourself about your about Yes, your but see, that's the thing about intention. Uh, intentionality. I, I, I'm sorry to frustrate, be. but I think this can discussion I, is useful. Can I ask you another uh, okay. question? Can, well, let me just say yes, one thing. All right. <laughs> intentionality can't be illusory because to have an illusion is itself an intentional state. It's an illusion of something. Well, I, I, as Oliver Sacks has said, hallucinations are real to those people that have them. Mm -hmm. Those are okay. certain. They are every true. bit as real as everything that happens to us in this room, to, if you have an hallucination. And what about investigating a largely unobservable flat universe? What? I mean, it, I mean the flat universe, as you have written in, in your book, is, is, is largely unobservable. No, I mean, it's no, just I'm a, sorry. It's a That's very the whole point. Small I only talk it. about what we can observe. We observed, we measure the flatness of the universe. We don't measure something we can't observe. We measure a triangle that's very large and measure that the sum of the angles are 180 degrees. That's measurement. The observable universe is flat. What happens beyond the observable universe? Who knows? Okay, if space and time originated from the Big Bang, how could a quantum, how could a quantum tunneling even have occurred before there was space-time? This is to you, obviously. Well, look, I mean, obviously it's a complex thing, but the first point is, let me give two versions of an answer, okay? Bo it, it, it's a I, complex I, I answer, but let me, let me just basically say, general relativity, the beauty of general relativity, is a theory of space and time. It shows that what we experience as gravity is really a manifestation of the fact that space-time is curved. It's an amazing, amazing revelation that happens to be true. Okay, now... 
the real problem in physics is that this theory, general relativity, this force of gravity, is different than the other three forces of nature, which have very good quantum mechanical definitions. Now, quantum mechanics tells us that the variables of that system fluctuate. They, 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 they pop in and out of existence, they, they change over small scales, they do lots of things that classically is impossible. If you had a quantum theory of gravity, then the fundamental parameters of, uh, of that quantum theory would be space and time. And they would fluctuate wildly, pop in and out of existence, and do all the other things that, other, that, that, that are associated with the other quantum theories. So if you had a quantum theory of gravity, and we don't, some people think string theory is a good approximation, it would, of necessity, have that property by merging quantum mechanics with, with, with space and time. So it would be a natural, in fact, it would be, it'd be impossible for it not to happen, that spaces, that universes, space-times pop into existence. That can happen. But, let me say, having said that, there's a problem with the words, not the mathematics. And that is that it, since space and time are affected by matter, once, it, once you get to a point where, where, you, where, where, you're, where the quantum mechanics of gravity becomes important, space and time themselves may not be appropriate variables. Time itself may arise out of the Big Bang. There may be no time before the Big Bang, in which case the question, what happened before, is simply not a good question. Lawrence, there are a lot of problems with words here tonight, and I would suggest that most of the people in the audience are not scientists at your level, and therefore, even by reading your lucid book, uh, your, your latest one, A Universe from Nothing, um, they would perforce have to take so much of your science on trust, on faith, on belief, no, they because shouldn't. they really couldn't assess it. Well, they no, don't have the reserves of knowledge to do so. Well, so you, my question is, we all do is that. anyone who is reading your book and accepting your explanations any wiser, any brighter, uh, any uh, more uh, intellectually fit than someone who, who, um, who believes in a faith or believes the um, doctrinal look, arguments look, for faith? Uh, 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 hold on. First of and, all, and people shouldn't take my book on faith. They shouldn't take anything on faith. They should say, this interests me. I'd like to learn more about it. I'd like to see if other people are contradicting. I'd like to learn about it. If they're interested enough, They'll, they'll do, that's the point of writing a book. I, you, you can't, I can't explain everything, but I can motivate people to learn. But I don't want to suggest, there are many, there are many scientists who are religious. You know, one, when I go on Fox News or, or, or other brain dead things in the United States, uh, 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 one of the only times, I've, I, probably the most useful thing I can say, for example, is that you don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. And that has huge impact because there are kids, unfortunately, who are taught in my country, go to church every week and are told you have to be an atheist to accept evolution. So, of course, they won't accept evolution because they, they have faith. There are well-known scientists of people of faith. Or they lose their faith. There are well-known scientists of people of faith. And so, being, having faith, is, all it all, to me, all it represents is you can have completely, in, that human beings are wired to have completely inconsistent and, uh, notions at the same time. But, but it, you know, that's an argument I can make. But they're scientists who are religious, and, uh, and they're, yet they're very good scientists. So, you know, that, to argue that somehow believing things means you can't do science is, is clearly wrong. What you do, though, when you go in the laboratory, is you become an atheist. You assume no one's twiddling the dials when you're doing the experiment. Okay? And then you come out afterwards, and, and, and you're not. So I think that that's where the scientists... They go in and assume... That, 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 that no one is twiddling the dials in their experiment. Could I make a practical suggestion that I think Lawrence would agree with? For, because this is a question that really is hard. Whom do you believe? Especially the layperson reading popular science or popular philosophy, for that matter, or theology. Because, Indeed. as you said, there's so much disagreement. One thing that can help, and that I would encourage folks to do, is when you read a book, read book reviews of the book by other scholars. And that can often help to shed some light on the controversial what issues. What you should do is actually search the literature. Because, you yes. know, I, mean, I don't know how many but books remember are late properly reviewed, but, you know, the review could be nonsense, just like a movie review. So what you can do is, what you, what you can do is question. Forget the reviews. The point is well, that you keep going to authorities. But you say, no, does no, this no, seem, no. hold on, does this seem reasonable? 
if it does, you know, there's a, one of my favorite quotes is from the former publisher of the New York Times who said, I like to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brains fall out. And the point is, if some argument seems crazy, it might be. And so don't accept it. Ask the questions and see what it implies. And also ask yourself the question, is this person selling me something to make money? Are they, are they, are they doing this? Are they selling me something literally to make money or are they selling me something not to make money? That's an important difference. Okay. Just going down the uh, list of possible questions here. How did God decide to create the world if there was no time to yeah. make any decisions? Yeah, that's a really interesting <laughs> question. I must confess that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's original. Deciding isn't a necessarily temporal activity. One can have an intention that isn't the result of a previous state of indecision. So I would say that God exists timelessly with the intention that a physical world exists. And then there is an exercise of his causal power uh, that brings the universe into existence. But we shouldn't think of God as existing, twiddling his thumbs from eternity, and then deciding to make a universe. That's not only incompatible with his timelessness, it's incompatible with his omniscience because God doesn't need to reason from premises to conclusion. He already knows the conclusion. So I would say that God simply has a timeless, free intention of the will to do something, and then there's an exercise of causal power that brings the universe into being. May I ask you a question that came from uh, someone in the audience, how do you know that other gods of humanity, Zeus, Zarathustra, Lord Shiva, uh, or Krishna, uh, etc., are not true? And have you falsified all these gods before believing that your particular view mm -hmm. of the Christian God is true? And if so, isn't that counter to the requirement of faith? It's not counter to the requirements of faith to say that you need to investigate the alternatives and look at the arguments and evidence. So I would say that in deciding whether it, which or if any God at all exists, you need to look at the arguments and the evidence and to search honestly with a humble and open heart uh, and mind. Now, um, that's not incompatible with faith. Faith is believing what you have good reason to think is true. Faith is trusting in that which you have good reason to think is true. And that's not incompatible with argument and evidence. And yet your own discovery of God from the depths of despair brought you joy when you were young. And that was surely something that came to you outside of an investigation. Well, yes, that's, that's certainly very experience. true, Rachel. Uh, I was not raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family, but I became a Christian my junior year in high school when a girl who sat in front of me in my German class, who was a radiant Christian, shared with me the story of God's love in Christ. And I had never heard this before. And it overwhelmed me because the idea that the God of the universe could love me. That worm down there on that speck of dust called planet Earth just overwhelmed me. So I went home that night and I found a New Testament and I began to read it. And I was captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. There was a, an authenticity about this man's life that I had never encountered before and a ring of truth about his words. And I went through a period of about six months uh, wrestling with these issues until finally, um, yes, I came to the point of decision and did place my faith in him and, and became a Christian, and my life has never been the same since. Well, Lawrence, you became a cosmologist having been a physicist because you wanted to be the first person to discover the end of the universe. Now, 
that strikes me as a kind of an apocalyptic intention. Uh, what, what was it that um, you have made to understand you... when I'm joking first, but I said I wanted to be the first one to know how the universe would end. It, it's just a matter of wanting to learn things. I became a physicist. Um, <laughs> I became a scientist because my mother wanted me to become a doctor and unfortunately told me doctors were scientists and it took me a while to discover they weren't. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, I, I became a scientist. Actually, I was, I mean, I was a, there are lots of reasons, actually. And it, part of it's philosophy. I read a, a book, great book on physics and philosophy by Sir James Jeans when I was in high school. But before that, I read about Galileo. It seemed to me the sexiest, most exciting, most exciting human activity is to try and explore the unknown. And I, I, I mean, I, I find Dr. Craig's honest discussion of his road to Christianity and his discussion of God to me represents, um, while, while I accept it, and I don't mean to demean, it's going to sound like I'm going to demean it, but accept that it's very real and means a lot to you. And so that's fine. It get, it's, it's what gets you through life, and that's, that's fine. But the point is, it gave you what you wanted and needed, and that's wonderful. But the universe doesn't give a damn what you want and need. And sometimes, it, it, you know, you just have to say, if I really want to understand the universe, I have to understand that my wants and needs, as much as I want someone to look after me and some universal love, and, and um, it may not be there. I have to accept that possibility. And moreover, but your discussion of God and, and when he decided is the perfect example of the problem. The problem is, one, it's, it's in my mind, intellectually lazy. This is, I can't, this complex universe, I can't understand. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to imagine a more complex thing, which I won't give any explanation for. And I can't really understand what it's doing, but that's a great out, because whenever there's nothing I can't understand, I can say, we can't understand God. Well, that's fine, but that's just, it seems to me, a cop-out. I'm sorry, and, and I, but, you know... Well, that, I, that's all right, because I know I don't do that, so yeah, the yeah. allegations <laughs> but, fly past me. I, but... There is something incredibly audacious, Lawrence. What is the <laughs> audacity of wanting to know how the universe will end when to suppose it is something that can never be proven to our satisfaction because it is so far into the distant future that you'll never know well, actually, if it actually, actually happens I, that way. I, actually, I put, wor I put mathematics to your words, and at the same time as I argued that we're within a, a few years of showing that empty space had energy, we actually proved, that given that, that in fact you require an infinite number of experiments. We can argue that it's quite likely that the universe is expand forever, but in fact, you cannot, with any finite set of observations, without a theory of everything, it, you cannot definitively say how the universe will end. So in fact, you can argue it's likely, but you cannot definitively do so without an infinite number of observations. But it's not audacious, it's incredibly humble. People say scientists are humble, but saying the universe was created so Bill Craig could be here is much more audacious than saying, you know what, we're just, we're just accidents Nobody's in a universe. That. I mean, I was just saying, it's, it's, it's audacious to use your mind, but so's literature, so's music. That's what makes living worth living for, being audacious. Okay, okay. well, I, I agree that um, the creative spirit is, is certainly an audacious one. Amen. Uh, <laughs> Bill, why does the immaterial God that you talk of necessarily point to the God of the Bible and ultimately to yeah. Jesus? Well, nothing that I've said today points to Christianity. I only responded to your question specifically about my own life. The argument that I've given today from Leibniz is consistent with any of the monotheistic religions of the world. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, deism. Why monotheism? Uh, and it could, why not, why it could, not indeed a, a polytheistic? Because it gives us, as I say, a metaphysically necessary being beyond the world of space and time. Mm -hmm. And Occam's razor says don't multiply causes beyond necessity. So that would be a proliferation of causes 
without justification to think that there's more than one metaphysically necessary being which is the source of the existence of everything other than itself. May I ask Zero you, causes if, is than if one. God is in every action of the universe, is that something that you would... If, if God yes, is ahead. in every action of the universe, then why do you assume that God is good when it would be possibly more accurate to say that God is both good and evil? Well, again, nothing that I've said tonight has been in defense of the claim that God is good. That would be a quite different argument. And I would argue for um, God's being good on the basis of our apprehension in moral experience of a realm of objective moral values and duties that impose themselves upon us. And when we ask, what is the foundation, what's the grounding for these moral values and duties that we discover, in moral experience, I think the best answer is that they're grounded in God. God is the good. He is the highest good, and he is the source of our moral duties through his divine commands. And I can't think of any other moral theory that would account for the existence of objective moral values and duties better than classical We, we had theism. this discussion yesterday, which God? Which God? The yeah, God yeah. of the Old Testament, which is, you know, you, the this God is, who asked Lot to have it, said, you know, don't, you know, don't rape these angels, rape my daughters. Boy, that God, you know, uh, 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 you know, the God of the Islam who says women are chattel and, you know, and, and you put them in bags. I mean, the point is, uh, you know, there are lots of different gods, and I've seen, no. I mean, we've had this discussion yesterday, and well, I'm sure we'll have it on Friday. Probably more relevant to that discussion on Friday. Yes, I but, think it will but be. But, it, it, you know, this claim that, that, there's an objective morality is, is, is offensive to me because there, there's no objective morality because every religion has a separate morality and most of them I find incredibly immoral. Now wait, you don't think that there is any objective morality? Did I hear you right? I'm saying it doesn't come from God. There may no, be no, an, but I mean, do you think there are objective moral values? Well, it duties? depends what you mean. That's a complex issue and we'll talk about it on Friday maybe. All right, but, all right then okay. we'll delay that tomorrow. So, Let, no, no, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it now, but... but, but no, we'll, we, okay. we'll talk about it in Melbourne. That's, okay, that's sure. good. Um, but let me just explain one thing very succinctly, Lawrence. There are two steps in the justification of Christian monotheism. The first would be what's called natural theology, which would just establish the existence of God, but not of any specific God. This would be something like a personal creator and designer of the universe who is the source of objective moral values. Then there would be that element called Christian evidences, and this would appeal to specific evidences, for example, New Testament reliability, the miracles and claims of Jesus of Nazareth, and things of that sort. And that would try to narrow down the field of alternatives from generic monotheism to Christian monotheism as opposed to, say, Islam or deism or something of that sort. So it's not an objection to these arguments of natural theology to say they don't no. prove Christian God. No, They're I not intended nothing you to. Said, nothing you said uh, it, it, it just motivates the Christian God any more than Zeus yeah. or any others, all of which you don't believe in. No. And all of which have, have, you know, I mean, you know, you, you forget the Old Testament, the New Testament. Jesus is supposed to be a good guy, but you don't believe in him. You're a good person, but you go to hell. I mean, come on, give me a break. Okay, let's uh, get back to the uh, subject of the night's uh, discussion. Sorry, we uh, sidetracked a bit there. Um, before we uh, wind up, Lawrence, you said the absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. Uh, and you talked about, uh, you used that when talking about other life in the universe. Are you willing to apply that line of reasoning to the existence of God? Absolutely. The point is that uh, uh, I, I would be presumptuous for me to say that it's impossible that there's purpose to the universe or that there's some creator. All I can say is that there's absolutely no empirical evidence of that creator, just like I cannot say, to use the argument of Bertrand Russell, that there's not a teapot orbiting Jupiter. I can't prove that there isn't a teapot orbiting Jupiter, but every piece of evidence I know about the universe tells me it's unlikely and unnecessary. And every piece of evidence I know about the universe in my 35 years of studying it 
tells me it's unnecessary. It's the same reason as, as, as I said the other day. This is not a question that comes up in scientific meetings. God never comes up because God well, is irrelevant. That, I mean, that's just factually not true. It's I, not I can how many give scientific examples. meetings have you been to, Bill? I, I can give examples where I've read the papers from the scientific meetings. For example, the uh, 2003 Cosmology Conference at the University of California, Davis, where Stephen Hawking presented a paper, and he definitely talked about the fine-tuning problem, God by name, as well as multiverse hypotheses. Not any, no, you know, Stephen makes public pronouncements. He's a good friend of mine, and he knows I get pressed. But, but, uh, but, it, but I can just tell you that people just try and ask questions, try and see if they can determine the answers, try and do tests, and it never comes up. That's why Stephen Weinberg said most scientists don't think enough about God to even know if they're atheists, because sure. it's irrelevant. Um, so it's uh -huh. irrelevant to everything we discuss in physics meetings. Now, the point is the absence of the need of supernatural phenomena, that is maybe discussed in meetings because we say, hey, can you explain this? No, there's some miracle. Well, that would be, that would be an interesting physical discussion, but, it, but, you know, but, most, but so far, no one's demonstrated the need for that. Well, I, I want to just come back very briefly to the point that I made in Brisbane, and that is what you're rejecting is this naive concept of the God of the gaps, where God is used to plug up the gaps in scientific knowledge. And I could agree that the God of the gaps has been buried, but that's not the God that is conceived of by contemporary theologians or philosophers of religion. As I said in Brisbane, the relations between science and theology are much more nuanced and subtle than this naive God of the gaps. Oh, I agree with you. The God of the gaps is dead, although it keeps getting brought up over and over again. But the, my, my point is, I repeat, that to understand the universe we live in, you don't need God. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. You're absolutely right. It just means that she is irrelevant. And does it also mean, then, that you think that... Um, science is the only form of knowledge that one needs to answer this question, is there something rather than nothing? Well, science Are is the way other... we understand the physical, the way we learn about the physical universe is science, it turns out. Now, if you're going to ask me, does science address, does the physics address every question that humans may ask about themselves? Obviously not. But if you try and understand the physical phenomena that are associated with the physical creation of the universe, then in fact, yeah, I would say science is the only way to understand it. But I want to hear from you, Lawrence, an affirmation that there are sources of knowledge other than science. What do you mean by sources of knowledge? Well, now, you, a moment ago, you were saying that you complained there are questions that theologians we can ask about say, ourselves. what do you mean by knowledge? Now, you're saying I, the same I, I thing. Think that, I think that, self, that revelation is not a source of knowledge. Well, I'm, not, I'm talking about... Well, let, let me give you an example. This is from uh, uh, Timothy Williamson, mm -hmm. uh, Oxford philosopher, who was responding to those who say that the only source of knowledge is science. And he's... By science. I think we'll I mean, tr try to uh, make this the last okay. comment because we're running out of time. All right, well, and it's a humorous one. Uh, by that, I, he, he, he's talking about physical science, ultimately physics, chemistry, things like that. You mean empirical evidence and rational thought? No. No, he's talking well, that's about what physical I mean by science. science. Okay, then you're, you're using a very broad definition that would include things like literary studies, for example. If, you, if you're doing a study of the number of, of uh, con consonants in the works of Shakespeare, yeah. But, well, here's the example Williamson gives. He says, um, literary criticism is a source of knowledge. He says literary... I, I taught at Yale, and I can tell you literary yes. criticism is a source of lack of knowledge. He points um, out that literary... Lawrence, Lawrence, can you please just allow Bill to okay, make the okay. final okay. comment here? Otherwise, we simply will be here all night. Well, Williamson gives the very charming illustration. He says, the literary critic can tell us that Mr. Collins is not the hero of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. But that is not something that any physicist or chemist or natural scientist could establish. That is a source of knowledge that's quite different from science. And yet, obviously, anybody who's read no, no, that no, knows no, that Mr. No, Collins is not the a, hero no, of Pride sorry, and Prejudice. but that's because, as you've demonstrated eminently tonight, you don't have the slightest idea what science is. It's empir the, the literary critic reads the book, gets empirical evidence, asks what the right. meaning of these, these words are according to certain grammatical syntax, 
that Noam Chomsky or others may have de de derived, and, and, uh, and comes to a conclusion. It's, he doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to sit in my room, not read the book, and decide what the answer is. And so what he's doing is empirical study and rational thought, and to me, that's science. Okay, then theology okay. will be a science. All right, well, um, we end on uh, a... Uh, tussle about what is knowledge and that of course is for all of us to decide I think most of us realize we have all sorts of different varieties of knowledge and tonight we've seen two of them at loggerheads and sometimes meshing uh, I'd like to thank you William Lane Craig and Lawrence Krauss very much for this evening I can only apologize for not being uh, quite up to the uh, oh the uh, details of this discussion, but I think all of us have been uh, inspired to explore more deeply, to perhaps read the books by our two eminent speakers tonight. Uh, I certainly have delved both of their works and uh, I, I'm still kind of struggling. So um, please join with me in thanking our two speakers tonight. Rachel, I really think there's no need to apologise. There's no doubt you have the hardest gig in the house. And uh, well done. So let's uh, applaud Rachel as well. <laughs> Having had the opportunity to be in Brisbane, I think tonight uh, exceeded that. And we're really looking forward to Melbourne. Uh, there are still a few spots left if you wish to travel down. Uh, as we heard from tonight, there's still a lot of material to traverse uh, in the Melbourne discussion where we'll be discussing the topic of, is it reasonable to believe there is a God? Well, I hope tonight has lived up to your expectations and that in some way, perhaps some small way, it has challenged your assumptions about life and your beliefs. As you can imagine, uh, we've poured hundreds of hours into tonight to make it possible and we'd love if you could just spare two minutes to offer your feedback. And the way you can do that is on the inside of your program. I wonder if everyone could just turn that open for a second. You can see there in uh, modern age, there's two ways you can fill this in. Either the hard copy, which you tear off and hand in at the ushers as you leave, or through the QR code, if you wish to use a smartphone, you can fill it on in online. There are three things there we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know how you heard about tonight. There's the opportunity, secondly, there for you to find out about future events or subscribe to information from our partners. And finally, we'd love you to consider joining the Reason for God discussion series, the details of which are on page three of your program, which covers many of the questions which were addressed tonight, some of which are deferred to Melbourne. So please indicate if you're interested in that on this form. And details of that will be on the website, lifeuniversenothing.org slash what's next. As I indicated, please uh, do hand those forms in at the doors. In the foyer, you'll find stalls from the Centre for Public Christianity, as well as from the City Bible Forum. And once again, we thank those partners who have made tonight possible. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, both Lawrence Krauss and um, Bill Craig will be at the back and be able to sign books that you've either brought with you or purchased on the night. So uh, once again, please join me in thanking our speakers and Rachel Conn. Have a pleasant evening. <laughs>